Without a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, and trouble he's my state. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Good evening. We're gathered here this evening to do our Wednesday night Bible study on, and we're going to be in Jonah chapter 4. So if you want to turn there um, before we do so, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank for this word. We ask that you just use it today to encourage us, to lift us up, to show us what you're doing and how you're doing it. Lord, we pray for our community, for many different issues that are going on in the community. We just lift the community up to you. Pray that you will minister your grace and your mercy. We also pray for the salvation of the lost in our community, that you will use us to encourage them, and Lord, to bring them into the gospel. Father, we pray that uh, you will reveal yourself to them in a mighty way and change their hearts. Or help your church to be strong, to stand up and share the gospel as we talked about this Sunday, to go forward in faith and minister the truth of what is out there and not what the world says is truth, but what your word says is truth. Father, now we ask just bless this reading of your word for the few minutes we're going to do this, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So we're in chapter 4 of Jonah. We'll be finishing that up today. Um, you've seen all that's gone on with Jonah, how it was concerned, and so we're going to go right here. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1 says, And Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. Now, isn't that interesting here? I don't know very many preachers who wouldn't love to go anywhere to preach on the street corner and see 120,000 plus people change their lives in order to make God happy. Uh, yet Jonah, he's gone. He, he went to Nineveh. He, he didn't want to go. He preached. He didn't want to preach. He, he did all these things that he, he was told to do, even though he didn't want to do them. And now he has seen the whole city has humbled themselves before God, has put themselves in a position of where they weren't eating and where they weren't drinking any water. They were fasting in these areas, and even the animals were fasting. And they, God responded to that, as we saw at the tail end of chapter 3 and verse 10, where it says God saw their actions, that they had returned from their evil ways, and God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with. And that's when it says, and Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been mad at God. It rarely does it work out well for you. Rarely does being mad at God be, is it a good idea? Because God is sovereign, he's holy, he's righteous, he's over everything. He knows what we don't know. 
He knows why certain things are going on in certain ways. And we should just humble ourselves before the Lord and listen to Him. So let's go on to verse 2. It says, And he prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I thought while I was in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. So let's stop there. So, so in his complaint, in his anger before the Lord, in his complaint to the Lord, he, he accuses the Lord of something really great, and that is that he is a gracious and compassionate God who is slow to anger. Now, I, I want that. I want that compassion. I want that grace. I want that slow to anger in my life. I mess up all the time. I sin all the time. I'm sure you do too. And we need this in our lives. We need God to behave in this manner towards us. Otherwise, he might just crush us. You know, here we have this pagan city engaged in pagan activities. Um, child sacrifice was a part of their worship and instead of rebelling against God and telling God where to do, what to do here we have this this wonderful city of Nineveh that I mean this huge city in Nineveh that just stops all the bad stuff they're doing and humble themselves before the Lord and Jonah complains about it he, he even knew that's what would happen because he says, that's why I fled. I knew you would do this, God. And th this complaint really seems out of place. It's almost like he's saying, I wanted the Ninevites to go to hell. I, I, I hate these people so bad. I wanted them to not hear the gospel, hear, not hear a chance for redemption, not hear that you are a holy and righteous God, but just that they would just be destroyed. Now, it sounds to me that's what Jonah's heart is. And he, in verse 4, I mean 3, he completes his thought, his complaint, and says, And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, he's so angry about the Ninevites changing their way and that God had compassion on them. He's so mad. He... He would rather die than see these people live for the Lord, even if it's for a short period of time. Um, so we have this going on. His heart is obviously not right before God. I think even when he was preaching in obedience, that he was not preaching with a right heart. Um, all that, whatever he did in chapter 3 that we saw, it's, you know, the three-day walk, he's preaching on the street corner, the word goes out. Um, all of this, none of it's with the right heart. And yet God, who wants to show mercy to the Ninevites, who wants to show grace to the people in Nineveh, when they humble themselves, they put on their ash cloth, they do all this stuff that they do, God says, that's what I was looking for. Uh, uh, he, he, he's merciful to whom he will show mercy. He's gracious to whom he will show grace. And, I mean, just think about our world today and what we're seeing. There is a lot of stuff going on that people need mercy and grace for. Uh, they know what they're doing. They even know probably what they're doing is wrong and evil in their own hearts, yet they still participate in these things. And they need, from our end, they need Jesus Christ. They need a Savior. They need somebody who will help them realize that what they're doing is wrong and who will love them and care for them and minister to them even in their sin, not participate in their sin, not support their sin, but still love them despite their sin. And yet, here we have uh, Jonah who doesn't do any of this and he sees a whole, <laughs> a whole city of 120,000 people plus come to know the Lord. Um, at least for a momentary time in, in history. Uh, so we go to verse 4. And the Lord asked Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry? Uh, now we don't get a response immediately there from Jonah, uh, but it is a good question. You know, why, are we, why do we get mad at God? You know, we, 
you know, he allowed COVID to happen and all this stuff has come about as a result. And we haven't been able to meet and so forth. And, you know, and we want to get mad about that or we want to get mad because we can't go to our favorite restaurant. We can't go to our favorite store and shop. We can't we have to wear these stupid masks. We have to do all this other stuff that inconveniences our life. And we get mad. And sometimes we get mad at God because he allowed it. And yet God is at work in all of this in some way, some form that we are unaware of. He's doing things that we don't know. He's doing things that we can't um, define. We don't even see it probably, but it's going on. And the Lord would ask us in these moments, so what, what are you upset about? Why are you angry? Do, do you basically, like he did with, um, in one of the Psalms, is, I, mean, I mean, not with some Psalms, when um, in Job, he, uh, he says, no, can, do you know how the stars got made? Do you know the oceans? Do you, did, did you put the stars into place? Did you put the sun in place? Did you create all this? No, you don't know the rules. You don't know what's going on. You don't know eternity. You don't know what's going on in this world, how I'm working in ways that you can't see. So how dare you be upset with me because I worked? And, and that's what we see here. So let's see what Jonah does in verse 5. Jonah left the city, found a place east of it, made himself a shelter there, and set in its shade to see what would happen to the city. Um, so he, he does his job, he leaves, he watches. I think he's hoping that he's going to see it destroyed, he, even though he knows in his heart that's not going to be the case. He's already, as he was preaching, he saw the people sitting in their sackcloth, sitting in their ashes, mourning their sin, and he knows that God responds to this type of stuff positively. But regardless, verse 5, we see that he went east of the city, built himself a shelter, and waited to see the response of God. He's not going to like the response. We've already seen that. Uh, verse 6, we see that then the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head and rescue him from his trouble. And Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. And when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, and it withered. And as the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted, and he wanted to die. And he said, it's better for me to die than to live. So here we go, Jonah leaves, he sets up this lean-to or whatever that he's got. Um, it's not very shelter-oriented. Um, he got a little bit of shade. And here, and God's like, hey, I'm going to show some grace. I'm going to show some grace to Jonah. He's going to give him a plant for a day. And this plant springs up pretty quick, almost a miracle if you ask me. I mean, it just, whew, enough shade that it provides shade for his head, rescues him from his trouble, as it says there in verse 6. And, and Jonah is pleased. He did nothing as far as planting or watering or anything for this plant. God, in his grace, caused this plant to quickly grow and to give shelter and shade. Um, but then we see that what God gives, God can take away. Um, verse 8, I mean verse 7 shows, shows us that a worm attacked a plant that God placed there and that the plant died and the, sh and the shelter that he had was gone. And we find, even though it doesn't really say this, that Jonah is displeased with the death of the plant. He's, he was well pleased, greatly pleased that the plant existed had an emotional attachment almost to the plant. Um, and when it dies, we find that he has an emotional attachment to its death. And then this scorching east wind comes in, so much so that it says he almost passes out. And his response to the scorching east wind and the passing of the plant, the, the death of that plant is, I'd rather die than sit here. Which is what he had said over in verse 3, too. He... Um, He seems to be a bit irrational to me. Seems to be a little bit on the uh, not making sense in. Um, he's angry. In his anger, he's allowing certain things to happen. He's, you know, just from the very beginning of all of this, he was mad. You know, he got called, and he's like, I don't want to go. He f tries to flee. He gets thrown into the ocean, swallowed by fish, thrown up three days later after spending all that time in the fish. 
does what he's told to do with a grudge against the people he's telling. And yet we find that none, and through none of this does he ever lose his anger. That he doesn't lose his, his bitterness towards these people who are just lost. And, um, you know, we, we, we look at our world and we see people that we could be angry with politically, um, personally, work-related, things that could happen. And if we hold on to it, we become like Jonah. We become bitter and angry and, and almost hateful, desiring for people to die and go to hell. Jonah had no desire for any of the Ninevites to be saved, any of the Ninevites to, to, to know the Lord and to worship the Lord. He did not care one whit about them. Their death would have pleased him. And if we're like that, then there's something wrong with us. There's something broken in us. And this plant and the east wind and all this that God gave Jonah is meant to be a lesson to Jonah. Uh, and we see that in verse 9 when it says, And God asked Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Yes, it's right, he replied. I'm angry enough to die, but it makes no sense. He did nothing for the plant, and God will say that in a moment. But, you know, we, we have this idea that we've got certain rights when it comes to God, and we really don't. God is God. He created us. We are subservient to Him. We we are to serve Him and to work as according to His calling. And even though we live in the United States and we have this Constitution and this Bill of Rights that we were given, God is not even bound by those things. And while what's in those, I believe, are, are good and, and right things, our God is better and more holy. And He can call us and interrupt our lives and do what He wants and that we should respond according to His will and His wishes, and we should have His heart when we do it. That's why in the New Testament it talks about that we should take on the mind of Christ when we go do things, because we want to be like Jesus as we do things. We want to have His heart, His mind, His thought. I mean, I'm telling you right now, I would love to go to some city somewhere, 100,000 people, 120,000 people, and began to preach, and within one day the city gets saved. We see people just come by the droves to salvation. That's so much so that we have to go out to the river and it takes us weeks to baptize them. That would that'd just be awesome. And it could be Iranians, it could be Russians, it could be people that we think are horrible, Chinese, it doesn't matter to me. That would be incredible. Jonah just sits there and whines about it, gripes about it. And then we come down to the final two verses of the chapter which are interesting because he ends this book of Jonah on a note of incompletion. We don't get a completed picture of what's going on. We don't get a, a finished picture if you ask me. It's just kind of like bam, there it is, it's over. Um, but verse 10 it says, So the Lord said to Jonah, You cared about the plant which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. But may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish their right and their left, as well as many animals? And then it's, boom, over. There's no more to the book of Jonah. There's no response from Jonah. There's no other um, talk about Nineveh and what it ultimately did or anything like that. It's just the book ends. But the Lord makes a great point. Now you cared about this plant, but you didn't care about the people. The people are far more important. The people are, are, are far more important to me, God says. You know, they're, it's a great city, 120,000 people. And then because they can't distinguish from the right and left, he, what he's basically saying is they don't know anything spiritually. They're, they're like children, spiritually. And that's why when you come over here in verses chapter 3 and that you see the repentance of the people, even though it's, it seems rather simple, you know, they, they fasted, they caused their animals to fast, they sat in sackcloth, some of them had ashes. And God 
knowing the heart of man, but also taking into account the spiritual um, inexperience, if you will, the spiritual naivety of the, uh, the people in Nineveh, God relents and forgives them. Uh, did some of those people return to their sin within weeks? Probably, but highly, highly likely. Uh, but God chose not to bring disaster because of what he saw at that point. And there's a very good chance that many in the city repented and then became God-fearers for a certain amount of time. And God knew this, but he cared more about the people and the animals than he did anything else. And he loved them and he, he cherished them because they were his creation. And he says, Jonah, you got mad about a plant. I'm concerned about lives of eternity. Plants got nothing to do with eternity, but these people have eternal lives. And that should be our concern. We should be concerned about the eternal life of those in this world. Um, part of the, where that, um, if you saw the sermon or if you were here Sunday morning, that's where what we talked about was born from, the concern for the heart of the lost and the desire to reach them regardless of the circumstances of life. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. So Father God, we just thank for this word. And now we're done with Jonah. We'll move on to something new. But Lord, help us to uh, be obedient to you. Help us to hear your word and obey it, to walk in faith and understanding that we might grow in our spirit, in our spiritual life, grow in our understanding of you, grow in our obedience to you. And we ask that you do all of these things in accordance with that name of Christ.